on March 2nd. I was doing my devotion of that morning, and then I write my one big idea for the day that I hope I can carry along with me, and that was to help those who are weak. And so I carried that along with me throughout the day as kind of my big idea, my charge, um, and um, just be mindful of what his best might be for me that day. And I opened up um, an ACU blog, and it was Abel's story about um, a person needing a kidney. So I thought, well, you know what? Um, God's blessed me financially. I'll, I can give some money, or I can add him to my prayer list. And then I kept reading the post, and it said, um, he had a rare blood type, and I knew as soon as I read that that uh, I had that blood type. And so I texted my wife the link to the story. I said, read this. She read it, replied back, and said, um, you're going to give him your kidney, aren't you? Um, so after that, called him that night, and we began the process. I had some, some sleepless nights. As quick as the yes was, there was a whole bunch of what ifs that quickly followed. What if your kids need one? What if your wife needs one? What if your dad needs one? What if you die? And so as much as there was what ifs, um, I knew that God was still asking me to just take faithful steps. Each step along the process, God continued to strengthen and confirm that yes in the midst of the what ifs. Yeah, the day of the surgery, uh, we showed up at the hospital and I had my inner circle of folks there to support and pray for me and be my um, strength. And I remember waiting in the waiting room and I see his family coming in. The gratitude from them was what struck me as first one of his brothers came up and gave me a big, huge bear hug with tears running down his face and say, well, you're one of us now. Uh, it, was, it was a joyful time. It didn't feel like surgery to me. It didn't feel like we were about to go into an operation. It felt like a, a party to where somebody was going to get new life through this. The depth in my faith and trust in God continued to get deeper and deeper um, through prayer and through scripture reading and through inviting other people to be a part of it who gets the credit for this is him. And I was just a willing servant that happened to journal something that he was speaking to me and then get to watch him and his fingerprints be over all of it. What a beautiful story of generosity, a beautiful story of faithfulness um, and of just leaning into God and trusting God. So I just pray and hope that you take encouragement from that clip this morning. Well, welcome and good morning to you all. It's so great to join with you each in the house of the Lord this morning. Are you well? Good. <laughs> Have you come ready to praise and give thanks to the Lord? Yes. <laughs> that was a bit average, wasn't it? Have you come willing to praise and give thanks to the Lord? That's a bit better. That's good. We'll, 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 we'll warm you up a little bit. Um, and also, we obviously want to welcome anyone joining us on the live stream this morning. We pray that you will be blessed as you watch as well. Um, but let us take a reminder from the call from the psalmist. We're saying, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to the Lord for this is the day that he has made and let us give thanks to him. May we open our eyes this morning to all that God is doing, all that he is going to do and all that he has promised. 
So I just pray that the Lord will just open your eyes, open your minds and your hearts this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand if you can or worship however you like because I want to see you dancing. I want to see you praising. So let us give thanks to the Lord this morning. just how great our God is.
How great thou art. And today, as we consider your generous living, Lord, I just pray that you would move mightily within us, through us, as we give you the thanks and the glory that is rightfully yours. So, Lord, I just pray that your spirit would just move in this place, that it would bring your life transformative power and that we would see lives transformed through your love, through your generous and caring love that surpasses all our own knowledge and understanding. 
So, Lord, we give you all the thanks and all the glory, for it is you who does all things. And, Lord, so we just thank you and praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Please, my friends, be seated. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. And now, brothers, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do so as we expected, but gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, so that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others may be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's great to welcome you to the house of the Lord today as we worship together. I have some announcements uh, to share this morning. And of course the first one is quite a sad announcement. I know many of you would have heard this week and be aware. Uh, but we're all saddened to hear of the passing of Sister Dulcie Reeve on Tuesday this week. Uh, for those that don't know her, Dulcie is Warren's mum. And uh, of course yeah, there's five children there in the family. So our thoughts and our prayers are certainly with the, all of the Ree family this time. And uh, yeah, be, be assured of our love and our thoughts for you. There will be a celebration service held uh, for Dulcie's life this Tuesday at 10 o'clock. That will be here in the auditorium where we're standing and seated right now, uh, followed by morning tea in the Burroughs Hall. So everyone is welcome to attend and come and celebrate a very faithful life uh, lived well for her Lord and Saviour. Red Shield. So we have our drive-by donation event in progress. I don't know if we've had too many people rock up, but we're giving it a go. Uh, yes, all right, just a sample as well. Uh, so if you would like to make a donation to the Red Shield appeal uh, today, Cadence is on the coffee machine. There's the other coffee as well, so you'll be provided for anyway, but uh, she's there. So you can donate for a barista-made coffee out of the machine. And we also have our Red Shield cookies. For a $3 donation, you can grab yourself one of those. I reckon think they look pretty swish. So uh, the Tassie Face Masks group has been um, in doing uh, what they do out the back in the Burroughs Hall, and just Kelly got chatting to those. Uh, so that group of ladies cooked up these biscuits for us and iced them there. And then I think Kelly packaged them all up on Friday morning. So we've got around 200 biscuits to sell, so there's plenty for everyone. So uh, please, at morning tea time, 
grab yourself one of those. There were, you know, two or three offcasts, so I have sampled those, and yeah, they're, they're very good. So I, w I am going to, you know, donate for one of the rigid ditch ones as well. <laughs> so yeah. The collecting rosters are still in the cafe, out there on the table. So look, thank you for everyone who has volunteered so far. It is National Volunteers Week uh, this week. I've always, um, yeah, been a little bit frustrated. It falls in red shield time for us, a very busy time. But look, thank you for everyone who has already volunteered uh, to do a collecting spot, and we'll be doing so over the weeks ahead. We still do have, though, 55 spare spots across our sites out there, so there's still plenty of opportunity. You know, perhaps if you haven't collected before and it's something, you know, you're not really sure about, look, just come and ask us and, yeah, see if we can find a spot for you and just give it a go. You know, if we, you know, found another 20 people who would do just that one spot, I mean, that already sort of cuts down half of what we have left available there. In particular, if you're able to take a look at Tuesday the 25th of May and Wednesday the 26th of May, uh, the team here, we have a, a couple of other events on those days we need to fulfil for the Beyond the Classroom. So if you're able to, yeah, really look at those days in particular, uh, that would help us out. Australia's biggest morning tea, so that's a fundraiser for the Cancer Council and Cancer Research. The Wednesday Fellowship Group are organising this and the idea is that you have a special morning tea at your home and make a donation uh, through to Australia's biggest morning tea there to support the Cancer Council. So I think that's on Wednesday, I think it's on Thursday the 27th of May, the official day, but I think the ladies are doing it this Wednesday on the 19th of May. So if you'd like to participate there, go buy yourself a few goodies and have a really nice uh, morning tea at home and you can pass your donation through to Sandra Pearton who will organise those to get through to the Cancer Council. Camps. So don't forget there is a youth camp coming up on the second weekend in June and then a children's camp the weekend after that. Uh, so if you're planning to go along, I know we've got a couple registered already for the youth camp. Uh, so if you're intending to go to the children's camp as well, uh, follow the links that are in the Facebook groups. So if you haven't got those, we can remind you of those and get your registrations in. I think they close in early June there. And then we'll organise how to get you all to the camps there and have a great time sharing with the youth or the children around the state. And the final one I have today is not an announcement per se, but um, tomorrow uh, Lydia will be travelling to Melbourne with Dave for the first of two operations over coming weeks. Uh, so there, so we would like to pray for you today, uh, Lydia. If, yeah, if you'd like to come forward, and Paul is going to come and uh, yeah, pray for God to be for God's presence to be with you, and strongly with you over these coming weeks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because you love for us, you care for us. And Lord, would you know, according to your word, that you want Lydia well. And in your word, you've given us lots of promises. You've said that you are the God that heals us. And that by your Jesus' stripes, she has been healed. And we just claim those promises for her right now. That at this stage in her life, that you've opened the opportunity for... Um, for doctors and medical staff who you've given knowledge and skill to to be able to help Lydia. And we pray for your great success through these people, Lord. As she goes to Melbourne, that's the first operation to, to get some tissues, Lord, to grow in culture, that, that will be successful. And then when she returns, they'll be successfully implanted. And Father, we pray for sight, for healing, and Lord, that you would protect her from any complications, that you would keep her safe, that flights will go ahead as scheduled, there'll be no hold-ups, and that this opportunity will be great joy, bring great joy to Lydia and her husband, as her sight is just really healed. In Jesus' name, we claim healing. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. We shall continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. And uh, Ian will be sharing with us today. Thank you, Ian.
I never cease to be amazed at how God works in what you choose to sing. This is not the song I chose to sing this morning, but three days ago I was prompted to come to it. And after hearing the songs that we sang this morning, this is, an this is a confirmation and an affirmation of that this morning. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. <laughs> To save the world, the Savior came. It was for this in mercy he gave his life. The news proclaim and give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Proclaim redemption's wondrous plan and give to Jesus glory. In every land where man is found, let us make known the story of love divine. His praises sound and give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Proclaim redemption's wondrous plan and give to Jesus glory. <clears throat> Their pardon is for all who come, their sins confessing truly. Then pardon, claim, O oh guilty one, and give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Give to Jesus glory. Proclaim redemption's wondrous plan, and give to Jesus the glory. Yes, Father God, yes, we do give you the glory, how great thou art. And all the words we've sung to you this morning, they just um, can hardly touch how great you are. But Lord, with all our hearts, we thank you for being a kind God who rescues and redeems us and saves us from ourselves and puts us in a spacious place. You supply all our needs. Why should we worry when you promise, when we seek your kingdom, when we seek you, your righteousness, all the things we need, you know what they are, will be given to us. So today, this morning, Lord, uh, we ask you receive back just the tiny portion of what you've given us as an offering. Lord, multiply it, bless it, use it to extend your kingdom, to put it where it's needed. You alone know where that is. We thank you in the almighty, awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, kids, it's time to go to Kids Church. Yay! Oh, I think we could sound a bit more excited about that, can't we? Yay! Oh, that's great. Now, friends, we just have so much to be thankful for, don't we? Yes? Yeah, oh, good, good. Oh, okay. I was a bit worried then. I was just a fraction worried. So... I want us to come into just a time of, of sharing in testimony and giving thanks to God for all that he is doing, all that he has done, and all that he is going to do. So as we come into a time of testimony, we're going to um, sing a beautiful song um, to get us ready um, to share. And 
I would love to hear from so many of you to hear what God is doing in your life and what you are thankful for. So I'm going to invite the worship team just to return um, to the front and we're going to sing a beautiful song to get us ready um, to share and give thanks to God. So I want to just say that, you know, you're amongst friends. We want to give glory and honour to God for what God is doing in your life too. So we want to give thanks with you. So I want to encourage you to come after we've sung and just share your testimony with us. Share what God is doing. Let us give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. I'd like to give thanks to the Lord this morning for good health and for um, our health system. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for that, that I'm still alive today because of our health system and those very dedicated people who work in it. I know they come under a bit of fire from time to time, particularly at uh, election time, um, but we, ha we are wonderfully provided. And I think particularly of my friends in India, I've been there a number of times, they have a very good health system, but it's totally overwhelmed at the moment. And uh, I share some of the sorrow of those who, who desperately need health care and just can't get it. And so I thank the Lord for his goodness, um, his faithfulness, the privilege we all share of being in this country and how we are supported by our health system. Thanks, Ian. Anyone else who wants to come and give thanks? I just want to give thanks to God this morning that he can use us in all sorts of unusual situations. You know, it's amazing when you're listening to God that sometimes he'll just drop something into your mind or suggest you do something and it, it has a great reward. And just a while ago, Jan and I were off on our camper van wandering around the west coast and we came back through to Hamilton down south. There's a lovely little camping spot there, um, a free camp. And uh, we were staying... We pulled up and um, got ourselves all set up and then we were looking around and I got talking to some of the people that were camped there already and it was really quite pleasant. You know, they were from the, the mainland and one of them was they'd dedicated nine months travelling around. They do it regularly apparently and they were very organised. 
um, I was really impressed actually. And then as I was walking up to the toilet block, there was a guy in the car park there, it's a little bit separated from the camping ground itself, and he had a, a car, a big four-wheel drive with a boat on the back of it, and uh, he was having all sorts of trouble. He had the bonnet up and he was obviously very, very agitated and he was crawling underneath and doing all sorts of things and you could see he was really, really frustrated and angry and uh, I said hello to him and he you know, was there anything I could do, you know, and kind of disappeared under the bonnet again and, and then he came up again and he had, he scunning his knuckles, he had a big flap of skin and he was wrapping something around it and swearing and cursing as they do. And his poor wife was kind of shuffling around him, trying to help, and everything she suggests, no, I've already done that. Oh, that won't work, woman. You know. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, this poor woman. And I thought, I'll just leave him to it. <laughs> so I went back, and then a bit later on, I went past, and he was still there. This was ages after. And he was still having trouble. And I said, look, is there anything I can do? Look, if there's anything I can do, I'll, I'll help you. And, uh, and he took no notice of me, and his wife poked her head under the bottom and said, this man said, is there anything he can do to help? And he goes, oh, you know. And then he finally came up and he said, well, you haven't got a, a cable tire, have you? And I thought, well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but I said, oh, no, look, I haven't, but I'll see if anyone else has. So I went back down to the campsite and I went straight to this guy that I'd been talking to before. I thought, now, if anyone's got a cable tie, this guy has. And so he said, yeah, sure, I've got a cable tie. He said, look, I've got a packet of a pure with them. Uh, you're welcome to them. And I said, oh, it's for the guy up in the car park. And he said, oh, yeah, he's been there for a long time. And it was obvious that all of them had steered clear of him because of all this <laughs> anger and frustration that he was uh, exhibiting. So I took the cable ties up to him and I said, look, here, the, you know, uh, here's some cable ties. I've been to find some with a, another guy down there. And within five minutes, he'd fixed the problem. Five minutes. And the transformation that came over that guy was unbelievable. Suddenly he was hugging his wife and telling her what a wonderful wife she was, and, <laughs> as guys do when it's all the crisis has passed. <laughs> and um, he, he thanked me very much. And I said, look, it's all right. You know, this guy was really happy to let you have them. And he was just so, so thankful that uh, someone had been able to help. And I thought, wow, that guy could have been there all night trying to fix this for the lack of a cable tie and for the lack of going and asking someone for help. And I really thank God that he was able to just show me that this guy behind all that anger and frustration was just a guy in need. <laughs> and I understand that because I get like that sometimes. And um, it, it was just so nice to see. And I, I actually thought, well, I may have saved a marriage here, so God has been able to use me in amazing ways. <laughs> so just those little promptings. If he prompts you at times, sometimes it's to be almost like the Good Samaritan or an angel or something, just to be there at that time of need. Listen, listen to God. He knows what people need. And often we're the people that can bring it. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I think sometimes it's, um, it's easier, easy for us to kind of draw into the Lord and say, Lord, I need this and I need that. I want this and I want that. And sometimes we forget to start with giving him thanks because he has given us all that we need. Uh, so I want to encourage you all to, to draw into the Lord and just give that thanks to him often. Um, I was reminded this week of the importance of giving thanks um, and that's why I want us to spend that time even contemplating what we are thankful for. Um, and I mean, we are thankful for you all here. I mean, we are, we are incredibly blessed with some um, beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ and we've got a beautiful range of volunteers here, um, which we appreciate and, and we're thankful to. So we thank God for you all and for our volunteers as well, especially as we enter Volunteer Week. Um, we're mindful of that. So I want to encourage you to give thanks to God for his direction, for his leading and let us be faithful in what he's calling us to, even getting going into a situation that we not necessarily might not want to go into um, to, to get a cable tie for someone that would mean the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's little acts of kindness as well 
Um, it's, it's a reminder to be there for one another. So continue to draw into God and give thanks for his leading and his direction. May he bless you. Uh, we're going to be continually blessed um, as the songsters come and deliver a message.
Well, let's imagine you're walking along the street, perhaps somewhere through the Launceston CBD, for example, and you see someone coming towards you. And as they get closer to you, you suddenly realise that they're handing out $50 notes. How would you feel? Would you be thankful? They say, I want to bless you with that gift of $50. Have a great day. (laughs) Would you be a bit disbelieving someone could be so generous? Well, then you walk on some more. And once again, you see someone up the street who's handing things out to people, but you can't see exactly what. So you draw a bit closer. And when you get there, that person says, Hi, I'd really like the best of you today. Here's a gift of $2. Woohoo! Would you still feel as excited? Yes. Would you still feel as thankful? Well, if you'd received the $50 first and then received the two, would you think, hang on, what's going on here? I like the $50 better. Well, here's another question. Do you think both of the givers would have experienced joy from being able to give to others, irrespective of whatever capacity they had to give? You know, obviously the capacity of the first giver in the example was greater. But would not both givers have been joyful from that ability to be able to bless others? Well, today we're going to be talking about generosity, about generous living. You know, generosity, the quality of being kind and showing a readiness to give more of something, including money, than is strictly necessary or expected. I know giving something that the church frequently speaks about, and we're no exception here at the Lonnie Salvos. We've had our self-denial appeal earlier this year. We're now in Red Shield at time, and there is an appeal open at the moment for donations to help the hospitals in India and the COVID crisis that they're experiencing. It's one we haven't mentioned in the last couple of weeks, but the Salvation Army have put a call out, if you're able to, to donate in that way to help our fellow brothers and sisters in India and the uh, the struggle that there is on their health system, as Ian has mentioned. Um, If you would like to, that's being done through the self-denial site. So you head to www.selfdenial.info and if you click on the donate now, it'll take you to the page that is talking about that. So perhaps it is with a little hesitation I speak about giving again, but it's important that we do so. You know, in financial support of our faith community here, I know many of you are already participating in the plan giving program that we have in place. Uh, The plan giving program, it runs over a cycle of three years. And our current one is drawing to a close at the end of June. And the next three yearly cycle will commence from the first week of July. So in some respects, that's an administrative and a recording matter. We could have just transferred you all across into the next cycle and perhaps not worried about talking about giving and generous living at all. But I think we should take the opportunity to consider our giving once again at this time. Scriptures speak extensively. They speak a lot on giving and finances. And of course, living a generous life is not just about our financial giving. It covers all parts of our life, all the ways in which we give. And through the month of June, as we focus on this aspect of generous living, we're going to consider how we do that as an outworking of our mission intentions. How we live a generous life as we care for people, as we create faith pathways, as we are building healthy communities, and as we are working for justice. But for today... We're going to take a look at the scripture that Bruce read to us earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, there's much solid wisdom in this passage about living a generous life, and not just in respect to financial aspects, even though that is a focus there. Paul has been travelling, as he did quite a bit, around the area of Macedonia in the Middle East. And he's focused on two main things on his trip. He's going back to the churches that he had a hand in establishing So the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, at Berea, to encourage the people in their faith. Now he's sharing with them once again to make sure they're still standing strong, that they're continuing to grow spiritually, that the people are being ambassadors for Jesus Christ as they follow the example that Jesus has given us to follow. And second, 
Paul is on a multi-country fundraising campaign. He was one of the world's first crowd fundraisers. He's touching base with the churches that he started to ask them to give generously to the church in Jerusalem. And that church was in a desperate situation at this time. There was a major famine in the region of Jerusalem and it decimated crops and made many of the Jerusalem Christians even more dependent on the Roman government than they were previously. We know the Roman government wasn't the most generous going around. And we're already talking about people who didn't have much to begin with, had been living pretty much a subsistence life before this famine had swept over the area. So they certainly were in desperate need of outside assistance. Hence Paul's encouragement for the churches to give generously to their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And specifically these verses are an encouragement to the Corinthian church to do so. Paul holds up the churches in the area of Macedonia as the example to follow. As he starts with, And now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that the God has given the Macedonian churches. Grace. It's a key word through what all Paul speaks of here. It's used ten times across chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians with several different nuances. We'll look at a couple of those in more detail. But as an overview, this grace was present in the Macedonian churches through the enablement or being able to give. It was present through the favour and opportunity to give. Being, having people available and being able to undertake the gracious work of the collection itself. Knowing and seeing the gracious character of the Lord working amongst them. And of course, grace is an expression of thanks to God for it all. I think we've really got to focus on this word grace because it reveals the key. You know, their motivation for giving it wasn't external pressure. It was internal grace. It's so important to understand it that way. For this, Paul holds up the example of the Macedonian churches as a comparison to the church in Corinth. He's not pitting them as a them against you scenario. It's not a put down. Paul is trying to serve to the Corinthian church because, you know, generous living, giving, it's not a competition sport. More so, Paul is simply saying something along the lines of, look at what they're doing with the little that God has entrusted to them and how God is working amongst them and blessing them as a result. Paul goes on to outline this further in verses 2 to 5. He says, In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. You know, the people in the Macedonian churches, they weren't well off by any means. Yet they still gave sacrificially on their own, of their own accord to Paul's request. And indeed, they pleaded with Paul for the opportunity to participate in this offering for the Jerusalem church. It was a giving which extended from their dedication and commitment given first to their Lord and Saviour whom they served. So then in that way, they didn't see this as a burden. They didn't see this as something they had to do. They saw it as an act of service and consecration that they could offer in gratitude for the great love and salvation they'd experienced from knowing Jesus Christ. The Macedonian churches understood the remarkable way that generosity becomes a gift to the giver. And they didn't want to miss out on being a part of that, on the blessing of participating and the blessing of overflowing joy that was present amongst them as a result. You know, living a life of service to our Lord and Saviour is a life of overflowing joy. Do I get an amen to that? <laughs> living a life of service to our Lord and Saviour is a life of overflowing joy. Yes, it's not always easy. There is sacrifice, there is trial, there is hardship, all of which was the case for the churches in Macedonia. But let us never lose the experience and realisation that a life of generosity is one that God blesses. And that he fills with overflowing joy because a generous life is one that is empowered by God's work of internal grace in us. Paul continues by encouraging the Corinthian church that they were living a generous life well in so many ways. 
verses 6 to 7. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see also that you excel in this grace of giving. Perhaps to paraphrase these words of Paul once again, he's saying, you've done so well in many areas of your life. Your faith is remarkable. Your understanding of the gospel is growing. You are sincere in the way that you love God. So make sure you also do not miss out on the joy of giving. Don't skip this one aspect of faith because it will be radically good for you and it will also help those who are in need. You know, if we are to experience the joy of living a generous life, our giving can never be forced. Verse 8 commences with the words, I am not commanding you. Now, the scriptures don't explicitly command us on any set financial amount we are to give. There is, of course, the standard of the tithe, of giving 10%, which should be given from the first fruits of our labour. That was a standard that was given to the Israelite nations so they could support the Levitical priestly tribe and the system of religious worship that God had provided to them. Thus, the tithe was a standard of giving that was a test of the sincerity of the Israelites' people's desire to honour God, to love him, to put him first in every area of their life. So in that sense, perhaps we could say that living a life of generosity is commanded if we are to live according to the moral law that God has given us. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength and mind. Love your neighbour as yourself. And with the revelation of Jesus Christ amongst us, it is seen that living such a generous life, it's not something we can achieve in our own strength. Not something we can do from our own resources. It's only possible by knowing that work of inward grace that comes to us from Jesus Christ. Verses 8 to 9. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You know, Jesus gave up everything for us. We know that, don't we? He walked away from the riches of heaven. He stepped aside from the glories of it all. He gave all of that up for our good. Not begrudgingly, but willingly and freely. To walk this earth in human form. To die for us. To win us salvation and forgiveness from sins. And secure the gift of resurrected life for all who place their trust and faith in him for what he's done. The greatest example of generous living that there has ever been. And through which all the trial still demonstrated that a life of generosity is one of overflowing joy. As we read in Hebrews chapter 12 of Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In verse 10, the Corinthian church are reminded that they were actually the first church to give and have the desire to do so to this offering that Paul was continuing to collect for the Jerusalem church. They'd given around a year earlier, but the collections had ceased since then. Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to remember back to that. Why? Well, he tells us in verses 11 to 12, Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I think they're very powerful words in verse 12. You know, perhaps you're thinking you don't have much to give, be it financially, be it in terms of skills or abilities, that you don't have much to give in any way. But God doesn't measure generosity by amount. He measures it by intent. We all have something to give. And with whatever we have, if the willingness is there, the willingness to live a life of giving, of generosity, then the gift is acceptable according to what we have, not what we don't have. Everyone, be greatly encouraged by that. God finds your gift acceptable if the willingness and the intent to be generous is there. 
to strive to be generous beyond what you believe your ability to be, as Paul described the Macedonian churches. You know, through all of this, Paul was not saying to the Corinthians that they should be generous to the point where they left themselves in desperate need, where they ran themselves into poverty. Rather, it's all about equality. Verses 13 to 15. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. That being a reference back to the Israelites' time of exodus in the wilderness, when God provided the manna from heaven, and irrespective of how much each person gathered, it was shared amongst all, so there was equality. You know, we shouldn't just restrict these verses of Paul to an understanding of fi- just only to financial giving. You know, yes, the church at Corinth was wealthier than most at the moment in time in which Paul wrote. But this was also to be a sharing of spiritual blessings, a sharing from Gentile Christians to Jewish Christians, underlying the equality of all believers that is now present through what Jesus Christ has done. When everyone shares, the goal of equality is achieved. You know, sadly, how much inequality we see in our world today. Lord, we pray that it not be so, especially across the churches. Lord, we pray let it not be so for us, for our faith community. There's so much more that is contained throughout the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 around giving. And chapter 9, verses 7 to 8, includes one of my two favourite scripture references on living generously. Every person should give what they have decided in their heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I know this is something a lot of you have done many times across the years. But at this time of our plan giving renewal, we're asking once again, to reflect on your giving to the Lord in all areas of your life. Money, time, talents, abilities, and so on. You know, we can't give with an inward reluctance or a forced compulsion if we desire for that grace of God to flow through our life in generosity. Any such attitudes in giving need to be overcome by that cheerfulness that seeks God's love. God loves a cheerful giver because a cheerful giver gives as God gives with overflowing joy welling from inward grace and thus manifests to the world his graciousness in a way that we could never show if we're giving grudgingly. When we're generous, we're not trading down. We're trading up to joy because generous givers experience a life full of joy. And as we give generously, we should be assured that God is able to provide everything we need in return. Maybe that not, 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 might not be financially, or it's certainly not just financially. But God provides generously through every spiritual blessing that we have in Jesus Christ, so that indeed through his Christ, we will abound in every good work. I'm not sure. Has anyone ever heard of Americans Jerry and Muriel Caven? No, it's good. I've pulled out someone you haven't heard of. I always like it when I do that. Let me share some words of testimony from them. After successfully establishing a restaurant chain, two banks, a ranch, farm and real estate ventures, and much more from what I went and read, Jerry Caven says that's when the real fun started. At age 59, I was headed into retirement, looking for a nice lake home. Then God changed our plans and led Muriel and me to put our money and time overseas. It's been exciting. Before we gave token amounts, now we put substantial money into missions. Our hearts are in another country now. We visit and minister there often. What changed the Caven's attitude towards giving? It was realising God's ownership that got through to us. Once we understood we were giving away God's money to God's work, we had a peace and a joy 
that we never had when we, back when we thought it was our money. After seeing the way poor Christians in other countries trust him, we've asked God if he wants us to give away all of our money. He hasn't led us to do that yet, but we've meant it when we've asked. Jerry says a non-Christian couple saw us giving and saw how much it excited and changed us. Then they started giving too, even before knowing Christ. They saw the joy and wanted in on it. He added, one of the big results of our giving is that we no longer hold things too close to our hearts. We can let them go, realising they won't last, but we will. Jerry passed away in 2019, but his legacy of generosity continues to live on through his family and through the Jerry and Muriel Caven Foundation. And also share a quote with you from Daniel J. Arnold. The joy in giving is watching God's work, seeing the supernatural foretelling of his plan and his word through me and other lives of former fallen men and women to reach this world with his offer of grace is worth the price of any gift. All the endeavours of man mean nothing compared to the one act of the Almighty God. The joy of giving is being able to say, as John did in 1 John, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. You know, to see God perform his work with our own eyes is a joy unspeakable. To know that he's used me to extend his offer of grace to others is an amazement and thrill with which nothing else can compare. The Bible calls it the joy of the harvest, and this joy is enhanced as God calls us into being his co-worker. I know a lot of you have participated in many plan giving programs across over the years. And I know many of you continue to faithfully give, even beyond what you would think is possible. You know, in my role here, I'm aware of the giving of people, and I'm so often humbled by, humbled by it. Sorry, you know I get emotional, but I am. I'm so often humbled by it. Humbled by the faithfulness and the generosity that you show, including your financial generosity. It's not only the plan giving program, as I've shared a few weeks back, over $20,000 were given in support of this year's self-denial appeal. There's a certificate I received last week, it's on the notice board at the back, for over $1,000 given from this faith community to the Christmas Bowl appeal last year. The Wednesday Fellowship Group fundraise each month to support the Making Happen project, which is currently supporting the Waterhole project in Alice Springs. They also support the Matthew Maini School in Tanzania for disabled and albino children. There are child sponsorships that some of you make through Compassion. We supported Sandy and Jeremy Baker over this past 12 months in the faithful service that they are giving at the Campos Corps in Brazil, where they are appointed. There's donations that we give to the Red Shield Appeal. There was the YFM fundraiser that was held in here last night that many of you came along to. Congratulations to the Barmy Army team, taking that out. <laughs> that wasn't my team, it was Jason and Ian and Dave, so yep, well done. And many, many more ways in which we give that I haven't mentioned. You know, don't look upon the church giving program as what we want from you. Of course, there is the practical element to this. You know, without your giving, this church would not continue to operate. Around 50% of our core income comes from our giving and our tithing. And we're happy to share an overview of our core finances with you in the coming weeks. We'll get that together. But as we talk about generosity, it isn't about what we as a church want from you. It's about what we want for you, what we want for us. Generous living is about experiencing newness in life. It's about finding out what Jesus was talking about when he said that he came to give us life and that he wants us to experience it abundantly. It's about what Paul expressed to Timothy when he said that as we give generously, we start to experience the life that is truly life. It's about living a life of overflowing joy. We are a generous people. So let that continue. Generosity opens the door in your life to what God wants for you. Let us continue to work for the glory of the kingdom of God with eager willingness. Let the grace of God be present in us and amongst us so that lives of overflowing joy are the abounding consequence of our generosity. I invite the worship team back up.
We're going to sing a song. Words that would be very well known to many of us. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. As we reflect in this time, as we still our hearts, as we draw in close to God, freely listening to the voice of his spirit, let us have ears that are ready to listen to what God might be telling us today. For all those promptings that have been shared in testimony of how we can just be there in that moment to share that act of kindness, to offer what we have generously to others, to be there at their point of need. Let God direct the response that he is asking from us in these moments. to know your heart as your spirit indwells within us. To know the heart of generosity that you have, Father. We pray, Lord, we may have listening ears in these days as you speak to us. We want to be a people who through the great blessings that you have shared to us shower out that generosity to the community around us be generous in our time, the way we listen to people, 
generous in our understanding of their need, of how we can assist them. Generous in our offering of the skills and talents that we have, that we may bring glory to your name. And generous too, Lord, in the material blessings you have given us. Help us never forget that every gift comes from you. Everything we have is not ours, Lord, it is yours. May we use it wisely. And may we use it in response to exactly how you prompt us to live out that generosity. We thank you. We thank you for the joy that is present, that endures and overcomes all things. We thank you for the joy that comes as we are able to be kind and generous to others in your name. So Lord, break down any barriers, any resistance we may have around this, realising it's all in response to you. May we seek you and you only as you prompt us in exactly how we to live in following your example and proclaiming your name. We thank you for the blessings that we experience here in this state of Tasmania, a place of safe haven really in the world at this time. Keep us safe, Lord, we pray. And keep us ready and willing and able to do the work that you have for us, we pray. Thank you, Lord. And um, may we all just stand as we sing in declaration that this is our God's city. This city belongs to him. May we see his transformational power through the generosity that has been the message today. Thank you, Lord.
may we believe, may we believe that the Lord, the Lord is bringing those greater and greater things that are yet to come in this city. May we declare that boldly and accept it boldly, friends. May we not just walk by, may we declare that the God is the God of this city, the Lord and Saviour of our lives. May we go out and declare that the God that we worship and adore, that He is the God of this city and the people that we serve. Bless you this week, I pray. Amen.